This is Eyewitness News. Good afternoon, I'm Sviso Zulu. The DA has distanced itself from the possibility that it appointed Sheila Singuboge even though she wasn't qualified to vote, let alone be elected to public office. Singuboge has announced that she will be stepping down from her position in the City Council as MMC of Roads and Transport. This follows an alleged sex scandal with Mayor Stevens Mokhalapa. In her resignation letter, Sengubuge says she is being distracted from doing her work as she is being vilified. The DA has accepted her resignation and says her position will be filled soon, but the DA's John Moody says the party is aware of the matter. I also believe that she has been a private citizen who has laid charges, open criminal charges, regarding the fact that she could be on the voting roll as a permanent resident. That is to the IEC home affairs to deal with, and of course the law needs to follow its course. Students who have missed the deadline to apply for the National Student Financial Aid Scheme can still apply online before midnight. The NESFAS application centers are closing at this hour across the country after it opened its doors at 8 a.m. Minister of Higher Education and Science and Technology, Blaine Zamande, says NESFAS has received over 400,000 applications to date. The department says it has been receiving over 14,000 applications daily and the number is expected to increase. Metro Rail says it's hard at work trying to get at least 43 rail sets back on the network following this week's train fire. Rail services have been affected since Thursday after 18 carriages were destroyed in a place at Cape Town train station. Kaelin Palm has more. Just a few months ago, Metro Rail was in a recovery phase and had 57 train sets. Now they are trying to get back to at least 43 sets. Metro Rail says the number of sets has dropped because rail infrastructure is being vandalized and destroyed and assets stolen. Transport Minister Fakila Mbulula said on Thursday, four suspects have been identified on CCTV footage but no arrests have been made. He says they are in the process of intensifying efforts to protect rail infrastructure. We are sitting with criminals who are banning the trains, the service of security in the trains is essential. And that is why I said, my starting point when I came to the trains, the security arrangement in the trains must be reviewed. Reinforce railway police, train these people for combat, and at the same time, crowd control. The rail operator said yesterday platforms 9 to 19 remain out of commission until further notice. Kaylin Palm, Eyewitness News. One of South Africa's longest running drama series, CC Dingo, will air its last episode next year on the 12th of March. The show has been on the air for 21 years on SABC3 based on a fictional mining town of Horizon Deep, which introduced South Africans to some of their most beloved characters. SC Dingo has struggled recently with declining viewership and loss of revenue leading to the SABC to cancel it. Eyewitness News spoke to, spoke to Emmanuel Costas, one of the stars of the show, about his memorable storyline. Mwangadulane takes a look. Isi Dingo has introduced us to beloved characters such as Ma Agnes Matabane, to iconic love-to-hate villains Cheryl De Villiers and Baka Hengs. For 21 years, it had South Africans on the edge of their seats with gripping storylines. Emmanuel Casters, who played Steve, one of the first gay characters on TV, had this to say. Camaraderie and that, like, we were all so together and uh, behind telling the story and so happy to be a part of that, that story and the production. Um, I think I'll miss that a lot, like the family, the Isidingo family, you know. For now, South Africans can enjoy the remaining episodes before they bid farewell to Horizon Deep next year. Eyewitness News. And secondary school students and retirees have joined forces at a protest in Hong Kong. This is the first of several rallies planned across the China Road City a day after police withdrew from a university that had been rocked by a two week siege. After more than five months of increasingly violent demonstrations, Hong Kong has seen relative calm since local elections last week delivered an overwhelming victory to pro-democracy candidates. A hot day in store for Gauteng. Temperatures have peaked at highs of 33 and 36 degrees. Cape Town's cloudy with the southwesterly, a high of 22. The top story in Eyewitness News this hour. The DA has distanced itself from the possibility that it appointed Sheila Sengoburge even though she wasn't qualified to vote, let alone be elected to public office.
Eyewitness News. In touch, in tune and independent. For the latest, visit ewn.co.za. Dedicate yourself to making a BBC News. Hello, this is Jerry Smith. The authorities in Britain are facing questions about the early release from jail of the convicted terrorist who carried out Friday's deadly knife attack in London. Usman Khan killed two people and injured three others before being shot dead by police on London Bridge. He was sentenced in 2012 for his role in a plot to bomb the London Stock Exchange, but was freed on licence last year. A former head of Britain's National Counter-Terrorism Security Office, Chris Phillips, said he'd long been warning about the danger of releasing such offenders. The fact that this man was not only known, but he was a convicted terrorist is a huge point. And, and actually it's something I've been banging on about for years, that we are releasing unreformed jihadis back into society. And we think that a tag around their ankle is going to keep the people safe. Well, it's not. A British government minister, Brandon Lewis, promised a review of sentencing and the conditions placed on those released from jail once the London Bridge attack has been fully investigated. Well, if somebody is released under licence, there are a range of conditions that they have to fulfil. It would be difficult for me and inappropriate for me to comment on the specifics in this case because it is an ongoing case. There is a whole range of licensing requirements that are put on offender in that kind of situation, but all of that is being reviewed as part of the investigation and will be reviewed as part of that lessons learned as we go forward. Facebook has begun complying with a controversial new law in Singapore, which the government says is designed to combat fake news. It's added a short message to an online news post advising that the Singapore authorities believed it contained false information. Grant Ferret reports. This is the first time a big technology company has been directly told by the Singapore authorities to comply with the legislation since it took effect last month. Facebook published the advisory notice on a post by the State's Times Review, which has previously been critical of the government. The new legislation was fiercely debated before it was approved by Parliament in May. Technology firms and opposition figures were among those who voiced fears that it would be used to silence free expression in Singapore. Failure to comply could result in a fine of nearly three quarters of a million dollars and a possible jail term. The US tech giant Apple has said it's taking a deeper look at how it handles disputed borders after it showed Crimea as part of Russia's territory on its maps and weather apps. The change, which follows pressure from Moscow, is only visible to Apple users within Russia itself. Hospital doctors in Zimbabwe have failed to respond to a 48-hour deadline given by the government to end their strike and return to work. President Emerson Mnangagwa had offered to reinstate hundreds of doctors dismissed for taking part if they met the deadline. The doctors went on strike in September over low pay and poor working conditions. News from the BBC. Officials in Afghanistan say a senior army commander has been killed in a roadside bomb attack in the southern province of Helmand. The head of the military's border forces was leading a convoy of soldiers and local journalists in Tamarja district when his vehicle hit a mine. Three soldiers and a reporter for an Afghan television channel were injured. No group has admitted it carried out the attack, but Taliban militants are active in the region. Police in the Netherlands are continuing to search for a man who stabbed three people on a busy street in The Hague. Anna Holligan reports. The popular market street was packed with Christmas shoppers visiting the Black Friday sales. Photos and videos posted on social media show them running away as the attacker struck. The victims, who were all under the age of 18, were taken to hospital but have since been allowed to go home. The knifeman's identity and motive still appear to be unknown. Police have urged anyone who witnessed the attack to contact them. 
Partial results from Namibia's presidential election suggest that Hage Gengob has won a second term in office. But Namibian media report that Mr Gengob lost some support in urban areas. His strongest challenger is Pandulenia Tula, a member of the governing Swapo party who's running as an independent candidate. He's reported to be popular with young voters, many of whom are unemployed. A tiny wooden relic, believed by Christians to be part of Jesus' manger, is returning to Bethlehem today after more than a thousand years in Rome. The relic will be kept in the Franciscan Church of St Catherine next to the Church of the Nativity, where tradition says Jesus was born. It was briefly put on display in Jerusalem on Friday before continuing its journey to Bethlehem to coincide with the start of Christmas celebrations there. BBC News. We are urging people to desist from such practices and we caution members of the public not to uh, be relying on unreliable sources and to be vigilant. There is a post going around of the uh, the CEO that the announcements will be made on the 2nd of December. This is fake news. That letter has been manipulated. We are urging the public to stop manipulating any messages or letters from the Electoral Commission and to stop issuing fake news.